Jesus, you alone are worthy of our praise this morning. God, we are so grateful that we don't have to manufacture your presence, Lord, because you are here with us. And Lord, you see us right where we are. You know our hearts, you know our minds, you know our needs, our struggles, our burdens, our pains. And so God, this morning, in the midst of all of that, we just want to pause and say thank you because you're worthy. Despite who we are, despite what we've done, despite where we came from, despite the color of our skin, God, you are worthy. And so this morning, Lord, we just simply offer you all of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you this morning. You can be seated. Well, we are really excited about chapel this morning. We have an incredible speaker with us. Author Chris Durso is going to be here today speaking. And um, just been such a joy to kind of get to know him a little bit this morning. And the really cool thing is, if in case you don't know, Chris actually went here some years ago as a student. And uh, he was a part of the B.O.B. clan, right? Everybody, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you guys should be super pumped, right? Big cheer right here. But uh, we're so excited to have Chris with us this morning, and uh, he's going to be coming sharing the word. Uh, but we're really grateful to have Chris, so God bless you guys. Pastor Chris. Man, how are we doing? Three people, okay. You're going to make me work this morning. Some of you are like, what does that mean? Uh, we'll get to it. Um, I'm honored to be here. I come from New York City. I'm a part of a great church there uh, called Christ Tabernacle, soon to be Saints Church, uh, where I'm in transition to become the senior pastor come January 2020. I only say all that uh, because it all started here for me. I was running from God, didn't know what Lee University was. My parents shipped me out here. Within a day, I'm here right before class to start, end up in O'Bannon, and my life changed. I got saved out here. I got saved driving to Atlanta every Tuesday going to 722 Louis Giglio's Young Adult Ministry there at North Point at the time. And, and then just being here church hopping every Sunday because I didn't know other churches existed uh, coming from where I came from in New York. So this is a full circle moment for me. So even if it goes bad for you, this, this is a moment for me. So I want to... I want to open up to you by reading uh, from the book of 2 Timothy really quick, verses, verse 15 of chapter 2. I'm going to read to you from the King James Version so you know it's real, okay? King James, that's how you know it's going to be good. It says this, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth, that's King James right there. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to show thyself approved. I'm going to take the next few moments and I want to speak to you from this idea, the student versus the scavenger. If you're taking notes, go on ahead and write that down. The student versus the scavenger. If you're not taking notes because you're tired of taking notes, take notes anyway. The student versus the scavenger. The student versus the scavenger. Let me just pray one more time. Father God, we love you. Jesus, we praise your holy name. Holy Spirit, would you speak to your servant? Would you have your way in this place so that each and every one of us leave this place filled with your spirit and in fire for you? In the precious and matchless name of Jesus, if you agree with that, can you shout amen? amen. Come on, I'm going to get you a response somehow, some way. Can you shout amen? Amen. amen? amen. There we go. A couple of months ago, I was driving my children to school. It was a big moment because it was the first day of school. Anyone remember the first day of school? First day of school for, for two middle schoolers. Not only was it the first day of school, but it was the first day of a brand new school. So my, my son Dylan, he's 12. My daughter Chloe, she's nine. And they are, they're overwhelmed by it. Now, how was I able to tell that they were overwhelmed? Well, you know, I'm, I'm their dad, okay, and I'm a good, good father. So our spirits were connected, and I was just able to tell. I was just able to tell that they weren't too happy about starting a new school. And there was just something about my daughter screaming from the back seat, Dad, please don't send me to that hellhole. It was then, it was then that I, that I knew, I don't think she's happy about this, you know. And, and I'm trying to talk to Dylan and Chloe. I'm trying to calm them down. I'm, and my daughter, she's breaking my heart. She's like, Dad, I don't want to go. What is, I don't know the hallways. I don't have any friends here. What if the teachers don't like me? What happens if I, if I have to use the bathroom? They don't do bathrooms at this school. You know, all the typical things you would, 
worry about when going to school. As I'm hearing my daughter say all this and run through all of her emotions, my heart's breaking for her because I want to be a dad that's able to do for her and take care of her. So now I'm trying to figure out how, how, could, I, how could I make this easier for her? How could I walk through the hallways for her? How, how, could I introduce, how could I introduce her to all her friends without her having to do it? Like, like I wish I could figure out the whole lunchroom fiasco. Anyone remember the lunchroom fiasco? Like, can I sit here? Am I allowed to sit here? Are you really saving that seat for somebody else? Like, I'm trying to figure out, can I do all of this for her? However, I realized in that, in that moment, if I did that, two things would happen. One, I'd be arrested. <laughs> two, I'd be robbing her of the experience of life. She'd have to go through this on her own. She'd have to figure out life, rejection, hardship, introductions, new moments for her self. So I decided, I decided I'd take a different approach with her. And my daughter, Chloe, she's a bit of an overachiever, so, so I want to challenge her. So I go, Chloe, don't you, don't you want to graduate? And here's what she says. Yeah, Dad, duh. <laughs> of course I want to graduate. I just don't want to go to school. And I thought to myself, Chloe, you are preaching right now. Because there is a whole lot of people on this earth today that want to receive accolades without having to do the work. There are a whole lot of people that want the opportunity to walk across stages and receive diplomas without spending the time that it would take in order to do so. We live in a world today where we have a whole lot of people that would love to be considered teacher's pets, but not enough people that want to spend time with the teacher. I've learned that within the church, it is split amongst the students and the scavenger. And the truth is, they don't sit in their own sections. They, they sit amongst themselves. Students sit next to scavengers. Scavengers sit next to students. They hang out with one another. They go to small groups with one another. They go to classes with one another. They eat at the student union with one another. They hang out with one another on the weekends. They, they talk the same language. They serve the same Jesus, but the two are very different. There are the students and the scavengers. I got definitions for you. Can we put, throw that first definition up of the student? Definition of a student. A student is someone that is able to remember and apply scripture when necessary, not someone that is just able to memorize scripture. A student is someone that is able to remember and apply scripture when necessary, not someone that is just able to memorize scripture. Write it down. It'll make more sense in a moment. Give me the truth. Give me the, the definition of a scavenger. Definition of a scavenger. A scavenger is a person who searches for and collects words anywhere they could find one. You, you know what I mean by that? Like, like words. They, they, these are the people that are showing up in your dorm room in the middle of the night, and they're just saying, like, I was just praying, and I just really feel like God told you what you're supposed to tell me, and you're like, huh, it's 3 a.m., go to sleep. You know what I mean? Like, like the scavenger. That's, that's this person right here, a person who searches for and collects words anywhere they could find one. And what I've learned and in this podcast junkie generation this I could just go to a conference generation, I could just live stream a service generation, I could just pick whatever church I want to go to, depending on who the speaker is for the weekend generation, and the kind of generation that says, I could pick and choose my diet, I'm not necessarily committed to a church, but, but I could just get around the things of God, and I could, I could read whatever book I want to read, I could go to whatever conference I want to go, I could, I could listen to whatever song I want to listen to, thank God for iTunes, and podcasts because all of this is accessible to us. But the fact is, there's nothing wrong with any of those things in their proper context. All of those things were created to complement your relationship with God. They were never created to substitute your relationship with God. I want to give you three truths of the scavenger. Three truths of the student. Three truths of the scavenger. Three truths of the student. Can you give me truth number one of the scavenger? Truth number one of the scavenger. A scavenger searches for words, but never looks to the actual source. A scavenger searches for words, but never looks to the actual source. A couple of years ago, I was preaching in Dublin, Ireland. And after preaching a gazillion times in Dublin, Ireland, at this one conference, 
this young lady comes up to me. She goes, Pastor Chris, finally. She goes, I've been trying to get to you all conference, and now here you are. And I'm like, okay, nice to meet you. She goes, you have a word for me. And I'm like, I do. She goes, yeah. And I'm like, is it different from the thousand I just preached, you know? She's like, no, no, you don't get it. You don't get it. Last week you were in Dallas, and I was there. And the Holy Spirit told me I needed to get to you because you have a word for me. And I go, wait a minute. You went from, <laughs> you went from Dallas to Dublin to get a word from me? <laughs> Security, you know. <laughs> and she goes, yeah, I know. And I'm like, huh? She goes, well, I'm from New York. I'm from New York. She goes, I go to your church. I got so mad in that moment. I was like, you're one of mine, you know, like. <laughs> this girl went from New York to Dallas, Dallas back to New York, got her a passport, flew to Dublin, all so that she could get a word from me. Now, I know on one side of it, it sounds endearing. Look how, look how excited she was to get a word from God. Look at her persistence and what she would want to go through to make sure she received that word. But anyone that has spent any good amount of time around the word of God would know that she would not need to travel around the world to get a word from me. All she would need to do is walk across her bedroom, open up her Bible, and say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. What is it that you would want to say to me? What is it that you would want to speak to me about this relationship? What are you saying about my student loans? What are you saying about the next step? What are you saying about the internship? What are you saying about the ministry? What are you saying about the music? What are you saying about the nursing? What are you saying about the photography? What is it that you are saying to me? Friends, we serve a God that died so that you could have direct access to him. And what I find in this world is that we are relying on too many other people to tell us what God is saying when we serve a God that says I want to speak directly to you I want to be in conversation with you I think it's good that you come to chapel with expectation but do you know that if you just woke up and prayed I'd respond don't you know that if if you were to worship me the same way we just felt the presence of God a few seconds ago as the team was leading us in worship that could happen in your bedroom it's amazing that the very God that spoke the world into existence, we take for granted as if we could fit him into our schedule when we feel like it. And we put so many other things above him, and he's saying, son, daughter, I am dying to spend time. I died to spend time with you. Truth number two of the scavenger, truth number two, if you could throw that up there for me. A scavenger never settles in the word because the scavenger has never allowed the spirit to settle in them. The scavenger never settles in the word because the scavenger has never allowed the spirit to settle in them. Do you know that this book is greater than a textbook, although it could serve as one? It could teach you history. It could teach you where we come from and why it is that Jesus died. But Corinthians talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is what guides you and leads you to break down every part of the Word of God. It says that spirit-taught things are led through the Spirit of God. And so many of us, because of bad experiences at some other churches or some bad Christian television where we watched at 1 a.m. and someone said for three payments of 1995, you could get your healing too because we found this water from the Jordan. And now all of a sudden, because of these weird experiences that you have witnessed on some late night rabbit trail on YouTube, you now equate the Holy Spirit to that. And that is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is good. The Holy Spirit is kind. The Holy Spirit is precise. The Holy Spirit is loving. And in fact, Jesus left so that the Holy Spirit could guide us and lead us. And I want to talk to the person just for a second that finds the Holy Spirit weird. Friends, the Holy Spirit is not weird. People are weird and people do some weird things, but the Holy Spirit is not weird. The Holy Spirit is the guide that God has given to us so that we could become the men and the women, the students that he has has designed us to be. I want you to be careful how you talk about the Holy Spirit. 
For the one that knows how to mock people that are filled with the Spirit, be careful when you do that because realize that holy, the Holy Spirit makes up one-third of our God. We serve a triune God. He operates in community. He's God all by himself, but all by himself, he is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So think about it. When you talk bad about the Holy Spirit, you're actually talking bad about God. And be careful when you do that because that word blaspheme is a pretty big one. Let me also say to you that please understand that you're offending Jesus when you talk bad about the Holy Spirit. Like, like I'm married, right? So don't think that you could have an issue with my wife and me and you be good. Don't think that you could talk bad about my children and me and you could be in relationship. If you talk bad about my children, me and you have a problem. If you talk bad about my wife, me and you will have a problem. If you talk bad about the Holy Spirit, mock the Holy Spirit, make fun of the Holy Spirit, please don't think that you're good with God because he's God the Father. God the Father saw it fit that he'd be Father, Son, and Spirit. You don't have to go on some long altar call or retreat to encounter the Holy Spirit. It is simply granting the permission. Holy Spirit, would you lead me today? So many of you, your days would go better. Your dates would go better. You'd realize if you should ask him for another date or say yes to another date. You, should, you would realize if you would ask her for another date or if you should not ask her for another date. Should you be taking this major? Should you be minoring in this area? The Holy Spirit is aware of everything it is that God has already set for you. And it's the Holy Spirit that will lead you and guide you. Truth number three of the scavenger. A scavenger doesn't discover the depths of God and as a result ends up drowning in the storm. The scavenger doesn't discover the depths of God and as a result ends up drowning in the storm. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Because if you stay on the surface level relationship with God and you do not spend time seeking the word of God, wanting to learn more about God, responding to those moments where you feel like they're God moments and God says, pick up the phone and call that guy or, or take what's in your pocket and give it to them or I want you to drop what you're doing. I want you to get to this event. You ever had a moment like that where you just feel like something's stirring in your heart? If you don't live in this space of faith, you will live a very surface level relationship with God and on one moment you could be all ecstatic and excited and then the next moment you're quitting. You ever met someone like that? Like they're preaching Jesus in the lunchroom. They're preaching Jesus on campus. They're telling you you need to throw away this music. You got to get rid of that clothing. And then all of a sudden next week they don't know what they believe in. You know what I mean? Like God's saying we're to be connected spirit to spirit. And the spirit is calling you to a deeper place. I want to show you more about me. I want to show you more about my mercy and my grace and my love and my kindness. I always think about Peter. Remember when Peter, he's, he's on the boat with, 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 with the disciples. They see a figure in the distance. Anyone remember this story? It's not that popular, but I'm, I'm such a theologian. I, I've read it before. You, you read this one? That was a joke for the two people that got it. Anyway, he's in the boat. Sees Jesus off in the distance. Doesn't realize it's Jesus because he's never seen him in that light before. He says, it's a ghost. It's a ghost. It wasn't a ghost. It was Jesus, but they've never seen him this way before. That's a beautiful description of revelation. It's not that God changes. It's just that you've never realized or seen him in this light before. Jesus gets closer. And what does Peter say? Peter says, Lord, if it's really you. Say that I can come out into the water with you. Jesus says with one word, come. Peter steps out of the boat. He's walking on the water. He's now with Jesus. Now commentators will argue that Peter was only standing on that water for just a few seconds. Others would argue that because of the size of the boat, it had to be a little bit more like a few minutes. I don't care if it was a few hours or if it was a microsecond. Here's the truth. Peter walked on the water, and that is a miracle in and of itself. Fair? He walks on the water, he's there with Jesus, but then what happens? As he's standing in the middle of a miracle, as he is walking on the water doing what no other human has ever done before, what happens? The waves start to crash up against his legs, and as a result of the waves crashing up against his legs, he takes his eyes off of Jesus, and he looks down at the waves, and he starts to focus more on the waves than the Jesus that called him to where he was. I don't know who I'm talking to in the room, but there are some of you, you are struggling right now. God opened up every 
every door for you to be at Lee University. God opened up every door for you to be a part of this. But something is happening in your world, and it feels like a storm is happening. And the Holy Spirit wanted me to tell you is don't look at your situation. Keep your eyes on Jesus because he promises to be with you, and he will see you through. I don't doubt that the water is crashing, but let's keep our eyes on the fact that we're standing in the middle of a miracle. Some of you know what I'm talking about. The fact that you are here is a miracle. The fact that you're going to school here is a miracle. You don't, you don't come from a family that knows of the church of God and is pastors and ministries and missionaries and is given a whole lot of money. You don't come from any of those things. You're here. The Holy Spirit says, keep your eyes on Jesus because if not, you will drown. Anytime you take your eyes off of Jesus, regardless of your situation, I promise you, you made the wrong decision. Peter starts to drown. Jesus has to pick him up and put him back on the boat. But I think about the moment between Jesus and Peter. Peter saying, Lord, I'm going to drown. And Jesus saying, no, son, you're not going to drown. And then Peter saying, no, no, I'm going to drown. Can you please help me? And Jesus is saying, Peter, put your eyes back up on me. I promise you, you're going to be okay. And then I imagine Peter saying, no, no, Lord, you don't get it, which is always funny when we do that, by the way. God, you don't get it. I am going to die. This is liquid. Man was not created to stand on liquid. And Jesus saying, I get it, Peter, but put your eyes on me. You're going to be okay. And Peter saying, no, it doesn't make sense. It's liquid. I'm only a man. And Jesus saying, Peter, I understand that the water is liquid, but understand my word is solid. When I tell you to walk, you walk. When I tell you to go, you go. When I tell you to step, you step. I don't know who in the room has a moment of faith in front of them. And God is saying, I want you to follow through. I want you to step and you will be okay. I know no one has ever done this before, but you're going to be the first to do it. Three truths of the student, very quickly. Number one, three truths of the student. A student studies the word. Easy enough. A student studies the word because he or she knows that a test could happen at any moment. A student studies because a student knows that a test could happen at any moment. Anyone ever enjoy a pop quiz? Whether you enjoy it or not, it doesn't change the fact that they come. A student studies the word. You know, the Bible says that we as students, we're supposed to be ready when? In season and out of season. We're supposed to be prepared at all time. You know that verse that I just read to you? A student shows himself approved. What does that verse actually mean? That you're going to stand before God one day and he's going to say, how many verses do you know? And you can't use Jesus wept, you know, like. That's not going to happen. He's not going to test you on what you're able to memorize. But what's a student? A student is someone that, not that just memorizes scripture, but applies scripture when necessary. So a student is someone that, that shows thyself approved. What does that mean? When life happens, when hardship happens, when temptation creeps up on you, when you have opportunities to do things that you know you shouldn't be doing, when your faith is telling you to quit and you know that you should be staying, you take that verse that you read, you pull it out of your pocket, and you apply it in the moment. A studi, a student shows thyself approved. What does it mean? It means that when life happens, I don't allow it to get the best of me because the word of God is already on the inside of me and it prepared me for everything ahead of me. So I respond in the moment, not as a scavenger that just searches around hoping for someone else to tell me what to do, but a student of the word that says, I read about this before and the enemy's trying to take me out. But if I just stand on the word of God, he will be defeated because he is no match for the word of God. A student studies the word. Truth number two, a student allows the word to study them. Do you know that the Bible is the only book that when you read it, the author is always present? Every time you read it, God is there with you. Every time you read it, the Holy Spirit is there. And yet so often we... We, we flip through, we go through a Bible reading plan, and I just got to read my, I got to read my books for the day, and we just skip through it and totally missing out that in one verse that you've read a thousand times, God could speak to you in that moment, and it could shift everything for you. That's why the Bible is full of that word that serves as a road bump for us. Selah, pause, consider this. Stop for a second and consider what you just read because I'm trying to get your attention. Selah, pause. 
Listen to what I'm saying. Yeah, I've read John 3.16 before. I believe there's so much more revelation and understanding in John 3.16. It does not matter how many times you've read it, memorized it, or repeated it. The Holy Spirit could still speak through it, John 3.16. Amen. Last truth of a student. Truth number three. A student is able to stand in the midst of the storm because the student is daily being washed in the waters of the word. In Matthew 4, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted. Have you heard this story before? Jesus is tempted in the wilderness. The enemy comes to him. And if you notice that in Jesus being tempted, the enemy starts to offer him things that, well, he thought that would persuade Jesus to leave who he was. Matthew 4 verse 3 says this, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, which side note, that's what the enemy will always do. He will always question who you already are. If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Are we good on time? When the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Listen, verse 4, but he answered and said, it is written. Man, that's a whole word in and of itself. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The enemy comes to him with a temptation, and what does Jesus do? He says, it is written. It is written. What a response. It is written. It is written. Let's be honest here. It's Jesus. Anything he would have said in this moment would have been a verse that we would have used today. Amen? Anything he would have said would have been something that we could teach, preach, or create a sermon series out of. But what does he do? He doesn't say a new thing. He repeats an old thing. He takes a verse that was written by the prophets of old, and he now uses it in this moment. He says, it is written. This is how Jesus is teaching us how to fight. Because he could have said something new, but he realized and knows how much power there is in what is already said. And here's what Jesus is teaching us in this moment. When the enemy comes your way, and he tries to break you down, and he tries to discourage you and lead you down the wrong path you have to be able to respond with what was already said it is written so when the enemy says things about you you don't have to say a new thing you don't have to be witty you don't have to be smart all you have to do is say what you've already read in the bible but how will you be able to say what was already said in the bible if you're not reading it for yourself it is written a student knows what is written There are people that buy books so that they could just Instagram the photos. Then there are others that actually consume it and read it because they realize that the content on the inside of it has to get on the inside of me. Jesus says, it is written. I wonder how many of your battles would be over if you knew how to fight properly. If you realize what the word of God actually says about you. So when the enemy says you're a failure, you, could, you, you don't have to come up with something new. You go, uh-uh, it is written. The Bible says I am more than a conqueror. When the enemy says to you that you're never going to be forgiven, you say, uh-uh, it is written. It says that my God loves me. He died for me. He forgets about my sins. He does not treat me as my sins deserve. When the enemy says to you that you're never going to do anything good and you're going to be bound by the sin that you've been struggling all your life, You could go, "Uh uh-uh, it is written. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. It is written. It is written. It is written. I know what the word of God says about me. It is written. And when you know what the word of God says about you, you also know what the word of God says about the enemy. The word says that the enemy, his native tongue is lie, which means every time he speaks, it's a lie. So when he says you're a failure, he's actually admitting something about you. When he's saying you're never going to make it, he's admitting something about you. You just have to be able to take it, flip it, and reverse it. If he says I'm a failure, he's admitting I'm a conqueror. If he says I'm never going to be healed, you should start praising the Lord because you're about to be healed. If he says you're never going to be used by God, it's because he's aware of the plan and the favor that's on your life. That's your moment to shout. Why? Because you're about to be used by God, and the enemy knows what God has to do for, wants to do with you. You have to know what the Bible says about the enemy. It's says it is written it says I don't talk to serpents I step on them it is written 
So I stopped having face-to-face conversations with the enemy, and I start having foot-to-face conversations with the enemy. It is written. It is, it is written. I don't, I don't have to follow you. You are not my authority. I will not submit to you. I serve one God, and his name is Jesus. It is written. The word of God says to me that you will not be ever matched for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It is written. There is power in the name of Jesus. It is written. So I'm trying to encourage the one that's struggling. I think if I could just, if I could just speak to so and so and they can give me a word. Friends, you don't need to speak to so and so. You need to get to the word. You need to open up the word. And you need to allow the word of God to speak to you. I remember three years ago I came out with a book called The Heist. And I was pretty excited about it. See, I'm a kid that grew up with ADD, had a stuttering problem. I hardly ever read books in school, especially this one. (laughs) So now here I am on my second book. And I remember a month before it was released, my admin coming into my office and bringing me advanced copies of the book. So it's a surreal moment for me. I'm in my office, I'm looking at the book, and I'm trying to take it all in. I knew that I shouldn't be an author. I never thought I was smart enough to be an author. I never pursued wanting to be an author. But yet here I am holding my second book. It was a surreal moment. As I'm basking it all in, I'm by myself, I hear a knock at the door. I didn't say anything. My friend proceeds to walk in. Which side note? When you knock and no one says come in, stay. Wait. You know what I mean? If you're not laughing, it's probably because you're that guy. So he knocks. (laughs) He walks in. He goes, bro, bro, what's going on, bro? Yo, I'm dating this girl, bro. I got to tell you about this girl. Completely oblivious to this moment I'm having. He's like, bro, this girl's amazing. She's this, she's that. And I'm, and I'm so frustrated I'm, because he's ruining my moment. I'm not even shifting my body towards him because I'm trying to give him a signal. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm not going to play into it. You're not going to rob my moment. So I'm holding my book. He walks in. I'm like, I'm like wow, <laughs> cool story, bro. He goes, oh, 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 is that your new book? And I go, yeah, yeah, it is. I was just looking at it by myself. <laughs> He's like, bro, I got the best idea. Let me get the book so I, could, so I could take it and give it to this girl I'm dating. And I'm like, wow, great idea, you know, for her. You know. So I give him the book. He gives the book back. He goes, like, bro, you got to sign it. <laughs> okay. a really long signature. (laughs) Hand it back to him. Takes it, opens up. He's like, that's it? I go, what do you mean? He's like, you got to give her a word. I go, huh? I don't know her. He goes, nah, man, you got to give her a word. And I go, I wrote the book, you know. (laughs) You want a word? Here's your word. Like all 250 pages are your word for you. And I just feel like the person that's walking around that's going, man, I need a word. I need a word. I need a word. I need someone to speak into my life. I, I want to encourage you and point you in the right direction. Like, oh, you, you, need, you need a word on God's direction? Cool. What about Psalm 23, verse 2? He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul and leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Oh, you need another word on God's direction? Cool. Proverbs 3, 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Oh, you're dealing with forgiveness, and you need a word on forgiveness? Matthew 6, 14. For if you forgive others their trespass, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespass, neither will your father forgive you of your trespass. Oh, you're brokenhearted and you need a brokenhearted word. Psalm 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Oh, you're dealing with fear. You need a word on fear? Okay, Isaiah 41.10, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you and I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Oh, you're tired and you need a word for your tiredness? Matthew 11.28, come to me all you who are weary and 
burdens and I will give you rest. Oh, you need a word. You need a word on healing. Well, Psalm 103 verse 2 says, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Oh, you're dealing with trials? Okay, what about Romans 8 37? Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. No, no, I'm really dealing with shame and I want to know if Jesus loves me. Well, then keep on reading because verses 38 and 39 of the same chapter, Paul writes, for I am convinced not that I hope, not that I speculate, for I am convinced that nothing in all this world can separate me from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Neither height nor death, angel nor demon, past nor present, nor anything else can separate me from the love of God through Christ Jesus. Oh, you need a word? Here's a word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word came down to earth, put on human flesh. He died, but three days later, he rose again, and at the very mention of that word, you're saved. At the mention of that word, healing happens. At the mention of that word, demons have to flee. It is the confession and the mention and the praise of one name and one name alone. It is felt with these five letters, J-E-S-U-S. If you have been saved by that word and are grateful by that word, I don't care what time it is on a Tuesday afternoon. If you are grateful for Jesus, stand to your feet, lift up your hands, and give your Jesus your best shout of praise. One, two, three, go. Amen. 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 What a word. What an encouragement. And obviously, uh, an invitation into God's word. Let's give it up for Pastor Chris Durso. Amen. So, hey, uh, in addition to Pastor Durso, we have some guests of honor that we want to recognize uh, here down in the front today. So, uh, how many of y'all were at Dorm Wars last night? Come on. Yeah, 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 you bet. So, we want to recognize our winners. So, let me recognize them uh, according to the category in which they won. So, the upper class female winners, Livingston and Livingston East, let's hear it for them. How about the traditional female winners, Snora, Simmons, and Nora? Yeah, you bet. And then finally, how fitting, last night's male winners, Battle of Ben and Bob. Congratulations, guys. You bet. Anybody ready for full break? Uh, all right. Hey, listen, I hope you have a great time. I hope it's a time of being re-energized. I hope it's a time for you to rest and to come back ready to finish this semester. If you would, please say the college benediction with me. And again, I hope your break is wonderful and a time for you to experience some rest in the Lord. Let's pray together. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight Oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Have a great day and have a great break. Thanks a lot.